Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Um, I'm just waiting for Ed was having a bit of connection issues with um, having a bit of software issues. So I'm just waiting for him to sign back in. He was in a few minutes ago. So it might take him a, a couple minutes to sign in. Um, this, if you haven't been here before, if you're if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can uh, comment. If you post a comment in the uh, comments area of those places, I will see it here, and I can pull the question onto the screen. And Ed, um, hopefully, when he comes in, and Ed and I can answer it, and we'll ha we'll have a go with that. Um, so today we want to talk. What we're going to talk about? Oh, here he comes. See if he's coming in. Um, today we're going to talk about the topic of deliberate practice. Here comes Ed back. Ed, can you hear me? Yeah, how's that? Well, yes, how's that? That's better, I think. Can you can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. We're just, yeah, we're just uh I started it, but I was letting them know we're just uh setting up Sear, getting things connected. So okay. um yeah, so this is where there's another um as I said, another edition of the Perception Action Journal Club. This is an actual journal club this time. We're going to talk about a specific paper. Um, and I'm joined by Ed Cullen from the Cork Institute of Technology. Um, who uh, He's been a, on the podcast before, interviewed a couple of times, I think. Um, so, um, and we're going to review this paper by, um, a recent paper by Anders Ericsson. Can you hear me okay, Ed? Yeah, yep. um, um, where he really, um, it's a really, we're, we were commenting before we went on there, it's a, it's a monster of a paper. Um, I don't know if anyone that's listening uh, read it through. Um, it really reviews a lot of research in this area and makes a lot of uh, points about things and stuff. So it's a really, really interesting thing to chew on, I think. So um, I thought maybe where we'd start at, I, I don't know if this is a good place to start, but this is kind of, before we read this paper, you know, so a large part of this paper is Anders clarifying what deliberate practice is. And so before we re you read this paper, what we understood deliberate practice to be. Um, and one, um, what the main elements of it were. Um, so one definition I've, I pulled out is a deliberate practice is highly effortful and structured activity with the explicit goal of improving performance as compared to work or play through specific tasks designed to overcome current levels of weakness. <laughs> so that has a lot of, so it's, for me, the, the key elements are, it has to be designed for improvement, right? It's specifically designed to improve. You're not playing or just having fun or working on things you're already good at. Um, and then the other component that's been a little bit uh, controversial over there is the, that it relative to other types of practice is more effortful and less enjoyable. Is kind of the and and then so those are the two main pieces and and then I think what I always think is the idea in the theory is that your expertise level is not perfectly related but it's strongly related to the number your accumulated hours of this deliberate practice right so not just any practice <laughs> it's this specific kind of practice is that kind of did I miss anything yeah. yeah no I think that sums it up I think you made a lovely point that that <laughs> the Original paper, like if this if this paper we're talking about now is a monster, the original paper was a behemoth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if there is a continuum for for size of of of, of papers, um, and but within that behemoth of a paper from 1993, it was quite simple what he was suggesting. One, mm -hmm. there was a lot of specificity around around his uh, the conclusions they were himself and his colleagues were drawing on, and. And it was clear there were there were very clearly identified tenets that could and should look like, let's say. Monotonic benefits assumption and so on and so forth that you spoke to around the uh, our accumulated practice. Um, that seems to, and again, it's a long time ago, it's 27 years ago, but but the simplicity, let's say, doesn't has has maybe disappeared somewhat let's say it's not as specific or as simplistic any longer yeah yeah i think so and i think another key point that he raises and i haven't read that 93 paper you said you were looking at it while you're reading i haven't read it in a while the, a key point that he makes in this paper is that 
that paper and the original deliberate practice theory is based on looking at musicians and, and is it chess players too or is it just musicians no just musicians so there's right. it's study paper the 93 paper that looked at the the violinists which were the the central part of all of this the four four mm. groups of violinists and the second study was was with with uh, two groups of pianists mm. um but but no solely now they he speaks to as as you as anyone listening would be aware of it any of this work he speaks a lot to the previous kind of working memory stuff of the chess mm -hmm. people as he cites through through it but but the the actual 93 paper was solely with the students from the west berlin academy yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i think i remember talking to him kind of the ideas came from looking at chess and also the working memory he did the little experiments he did where he tried to get people to remember sequences of numbers right yeah um, the really interesting stuff and then he went into yeah. the look for it more specifically in music yeah I think actually historically there's a lovely thread with Anders' work in that way that led mm. to the 93 paper that there was, you can really see a thread from his early work where he was a student, like an undergrad or postgrad himself leading through and joining up with people like Simon and Chase where he was very much watching these, you know, these giants of the space before him and linking in with all their work around memory and and working memory and and all and even earlier work that they did for the military and the like and how that seemed to lead them towards the the um their retrospective recall and and their think aloud protocols which then led very strongly and had a big impact on the 1993 paper um mm. because that's a significant part of that paper for the capacity of the participants to be able to recall exactly what it was they were doing at different stages of their development. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then so the, from that work, um, I think, you know, there's two things that, kind of, along with Andrew's own work, there's two main, mm. there's obviously Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hour popularization <laughs> of it, which I think has been yeah. well covered <laughs> and, and, you know, kind of debunked. I don't know if this is a word, but, you know, people have pointed out he, he just oversimplified Andrew's story. But the yeah. other one that he really discusses in this paper is people saw this connection that sports has, you know, we could apply this idea of deliberate practice to sports and ran with it. And th in this paper, this purpose of this paper largely is to kind of, Andrew's is critiquing that kind of extension people have made. And, and on the surface, like I, I could see, like if, the, we, if we have those two criteria, like practice meant to for improvement and being relatively less enjoyable and effortful. Like to me, I could see lots of things in sports, right? The example I always give is in running. Like if you're a long distance runner, marathon runner, one thing that will really help you is doing speed work, right? Yeah. Doing, but almost everybody that does long distance running hates it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's really unenjoyable, but we know it will make, versus going out and running at a moderately good pace for 10 miles is way more enjoyable but it doesn't really improve so the idea that if you focus on these aspects of practice and sports that really seem to be fit with that original conception of deliberate practice they, they and i know you've actually done <laughs> you know some work looking at these kind of things right yeah and i think that's that's a great point because i think we all like there there may be an an, an inherent feeling for most people not all but for most people that the one thing that you should be doing is the one thing you don't like doing. And the reason the reason it seems to be the thing you should be doing is because you haven't given it the attention you've given other things that that maybe are better in your repertoire. So it's not it that's not a big that's not a big leap really for our or our, our, and that wasn't a significant finding in one sense because we'd all there's a common sense element to to any development of anything that oh, oh I know, but you know, you, your your forehand would you know, you need to do more work in your forehand. I know, but I, I love, I love practicing my backhand. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, well, I know you are, but the reason you're great at backhand is because there's a self-fulfilling prophecy around. Well, I like doing it, so I'm good at doing it, so I'm gonna keep doing it, kind of thing. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I yeah. Think, I think that's where, I think that's where then, when it moves into the sport domain, especially when we start to talk about expertise, that then can either be highlighted, but it also then appeals to those people who have that that determination to get better then there, there's almost this uh, there's almost this um 
you know, a, a, a kind of a masochistic element. I'm going to do the thing that I don't like more than ever before. And that's going to have a big impact, which kind of goes back to your point around his original definition around that relevant to overall performance improvement. I think very often we look at relevant to overall performance improvement with an athlete. It is the thing that they haven't spent the most amount of time on is the thing that they maybe is the thing that's catching them out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to kind of foreshadow, you know, this idea, the reason, like we said, is a very reasonable connection. I think a lot of people do to the sports. He, this purpose in this paper is going to critique a lot of the, 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 yeah. the points about that. Um, yeah. So the expertise, yeah. One of the things that he talks about in this paper that I like is he, he goes into a lot more depth of the difference about how we in, usually understand expertise in the traditional research lab, which you might call a bottom up approach, right? Mm -hmm. We yeah. bring in a bunch of people that are either complete novices or hardly any experience. We train them for a couple of days on how to putt and we see what gets what changes and then we try to extrapolate yeah. that to the pga tour which yeah. is you know when <laughs> exactly, i put it like that yeah. is pretty unreasonable yeah. we i think we yeah. know that um but and what andrews um the deliberate practice is built on the expertise approach right and um mm. i i really liked um i i've never heard him say it but i he calls expertise reports is reverse engineering expertise mm. right yeah yeah so yeah so um he, he talks about, so expertise approach is finding a, a bunch mm -hmm. of people highly skilled. So not starting with novices, starting with the other end. And um, he, he makes a big point about being able to quantify their performance absolutely, which yeah, okay, that's one of the big issues he has with applying it to a lot of sports, right? Mm. Um, did you? And I, did, I think, and I, I, yeah, and I think that I, again, like yourself, I, rem I I noted that kind of reverse engineering thing, which which actually drew, brought me to a paper he did with Mark Williams in two thousand and five, where they actually outlined very clearly what the expert performance approach is, you know, and mm. it is actually that it, there's there's three key elements to it. It's it's capture expert performance first and foremost. What what does it look like, and how you know what what are the experts doing? Mm. Identify then the mechanisms that underpin that performance and you, and you do that again through a variety of different methods like, like your eye movements and your mm -hmm. your film scripts your um your your recall things and but then the final part is to examine how that got developed that's the retrospective work that's the interviews the questionnaires the journals let's say you know so it's 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 almost using he as you said it's it's quite a systematic approach with that three point approach let's say it's quite a systematic approach to say if we can get a sufficient amount of data on a group of experts extrapolate what they do and then copy and paste that onto someone else then it's almost suggesting a linear a linear progression that they then will attain that same level of expertise mm -hmm. that's where that's where the, the 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 debates have raged over the last number of years, especially since especially since they published that work around the expert performance approach and made it explicit. This is exactly what we're actually saying happens. Let's say, or yeah. what we're suggesting people should do. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, and I think for me the 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 third part of it is this the one that I never really thought about thinking about how experts got there. Like so, a lot of research was we do the first two. Like a, like a good example is the work like Mark Wilson and Sam Vine do on quiet eye training. Yes. So they yeah. bring in experts. We find that experts have longer quiet eye. Let If we could train novices to have a longer quiet eye, then we're kind of shortcut the route to expertise. The only difference is they don't go back and look at how the experts got the qu long quiet eye. So they don't look mm. at the training history. They come up with their own way, <laughs> right? So mm. I don't know many yeah. people that actually do that. Did you, I, in your some of your work, I know, you, did you go kind of try to do yeah. that? Well, one of the things we did in in the second in the second the, the study we published last year was we we engaged with the coaches as well because I think that was one of the criticisms that Anders had of er, some of our earlier work in that he was like, okay, well, how how do you how do you know for sure that that's what they should be doing? So that was a part of what we did. We spoke with the each of the coaches of the of the participants who are already bona fide players. And ask them, well, what would you, what do you feel to kind of get that coach input? Let's say, what do you feel this athlete needs to work on 
what is the rate limiting factor of their performance and only those participants then that had the same skill that was coming up were the ones then that were included in the research so mm -hmm. we we lost a few who said oh, oh well i think it's this he needs to be working i'm like oh okay well thank you but we're looking for a group who have now and we needed a sufficient number then of where the coach was saying, oh, no, this is what he needs to work on and oh, and this is what he needs to work on and so on and so forth. But that, so I think when we, so that's somewhat of a, of a, of, of a way of actually checking, well, why? So then when we, we would ask the coaches again, well, where did you kind of, what, where, where was this from? And very often they would have told us it was all based on performance metrics and missed missed attempts and matches and so on and so forth let's say you know and mm -hmm. um, not the same degree that again he would have done with with uh, cramp and tesh romer in 93 where it was a very systematic review of their training history from each of, like throughout their lifespan from a very small age through to and again i think it was it was 18 to 20 years uh, or 18 years was the 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 um, standard age for all participants. Let's say where they stopped the retrospective analysis. So we, we personally, in our, our our research, we haven't looked specifically at at the long term retrospective. But what we've tried to do is to try and get a, a, the an insight from the coaches as to why they feel number one, uh, what they feel number one is, what they what they need to work on. Does it align with what the athlete needs believes too? Because that was another element of our work. We lost another few participants mm -hmm. when we found because again, there does need to be that. There does need to be that. And again, he speaks about motivation a lot in that first paper, less so in the second the paper we're talking about this evening. Mm. But there does need to be that connection as well. Um, it's very hard to get an athlete to do something, even if you've if the coach thinks it's right and the athlete is absolutely no, no, that's not what I need to work on, let's say. Um mm. So, so that was somewhat of a connecting a connection back to determine what we should be doing now, let's say, and for for the work that we did. Um, but as far as as far as doing to the level of the depth and the level of the retrospective work that you speak of, mm. there's only been a few who've done it, and ironically, it's been in the sports domain. Mm -hmm. The likes of Hell, they did it. Um, Starks at Al Hodges, you know, mm -hmm. they're the ones who. But it was actually in the sport domain. Not too many have actually, in other domains, actually gone back and retrospectively looked at that. Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. And and yeah, you're right. It, it's not a and tried to figure out how they did it. How they uh, came to these specific mechanisms. Yeah. And his point about going back, his point about the the absolute metric. So he argues you need an absolute metric to be able to understand how poor performance improves. So you need to be able to measure your 40 yard time. You know, so most in most sports don't like you're the way we quantify expertise is relative to level or right. So, if, yeah, which is a relative metric. So in, in in his point is you can't really quantify improvement in his way, the way he wants um, for that. Yeah. So I, th I think that's really um, interesting um, way to I, I, you know, I think the expertise uh, approach. Um, the other thing I would point out, I've, you know. His so he talks about this and how, um, you know, how, how some of the mechanisms underlying it he connects to development of representations and, and things. This period, um, I've heard some people say that their deliberate practice is fits with kind of an ecological dynamic systems approach. Um, read, read this paper, <laughs> it's it firmly couched in, in, in Erickson's view of it, it's firmly couched in information processing <laughs> traditional yeah. approach to cognitive um and, and so but you but so yeah it doesn't <laughs> um maybe yeah. you could put your own spin on it but not the way he thinks of it um definitely not um so um he but so he kind of takes the and then i don't is there anything else point you know about that expertise approach or anything else you picked up you wanted to talk about oh, i think i think I think the the interesting point about the expertise, the, because again, we we did we did a paper back in two thousand and nine about determining whether the expert performance approach can be applied to coaching and the development of coaching, right? Okay. And one of the things, one of the things that we found uh, was it was with Paul Paul uh, Paul and Mark. One of the things we found was that, or was more suggested, let's say, was the the difficulty of trying to identify what which measurements you use. Because the expert performance approach that they put forward, they, there's there's a lot of options in each of in each of the uh, 
um, in each of the stages. Let's say I'll, I'll try and pull it up here just to see if I can. So like, let's say the first part, that capture performance, you know, it, like it speaks about laboratory testing, be either video or film or virtual reality and field testing, match analysis and simulations. Now, again, is that an either or or is it both, you know, mm -hmm. or is it all of them to be able to capture the, the fullness of, of expert performance? And then uh, the other side, then the, that next phase that kind of interacts with each other, that identifying the underlying mechanisms, let's say, they, uh, they speak about be that either eye movements, film occlusion, biomechanical profiling, event-related potentials, and verbal reports. Again, these are all process tracing measures. Again, the question arises, is it either or, or is it all of them? And how, how deep do you need to go to be able to determine what expertise looks like? Which then moves to that last phase with how, how is it developed? And again, there's a range of things suggested, like it's questionnaires, it's it's practice history, it's interviews, log books, time motion analysis, microstructure of practice, verbal reports. <laughs> so you're like, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now, now I, I say this with the with the sense of, and it kind of speaks to my my idea or my opinion around Andrew's work and even the paper we're discussing tonight. I sometimes feel that we need to we need to applaud more often people to put their work out there for debate as opposed to nailing them down on it. You said this, so that's what you must have absolutely meant. And even though, and you said this 10 years ago, so you must still mean it now. And you're like, oh, hang on a second. I said things, I said things yesterday, Rob, that I probably don't even mean today. Yeah. And I think we need we, I think we need to be we need to be a little more appreciative of the of the stuff that people put out there like I, I know you do a lot of reviewing uh, and, and, I, and I do some but no to the, to the extent that, that you do but I'm always hit but when I am asked to review someone's work is there's a real sense of privilege that you're being asked to have a look at someone's work and 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 help where you can not destroy it where you can you know it's and, and, I'm, and I'm speaking from my own experience of when people have re re reviewed my work before publication I've always sense maybe i've been very fortunate but i've always got the sense that even in two and three and four rounds of reviews they're really for the work they're mm -hmm. really for trying to help the work be better understood and more clear i'm not too sure if deliberate practice has gotten that fair crack at the whip uh, all that often yeah, amen. <laughs> um, I, I like reading this. I could see people being really frustrated. Like, um, it's almost mm. like this has gone on, and suddenly there's a whole bunch of changes in course that people have they looked at deliberate practice. They're like, "What? What do you, you've changed?" Um, or he's and but where this, if it had been a continuing developing discussion, like you said, all the way along, this would have been so much better. It's almost Andrew's almost got boxed into a corner. Of defending his theory, um, as I said, for a lot of reasons, Gladwell put it out there like it's all all expertise is from nature, nurture, right? You he, he, he put him on one side of the nature nurture thing, and like yeah. so, he had to kind of defend that. And then, yeah, people are <laughs> a whole bunch of people reviewed did these. Oh no, it's not the number of hours that. We, so I think he's kind of got boxed yeah. into a corner of of yeah. trying to defend. And this paper is. It's kind of, it's almost like a uh, trying to, he, he frustratingly is trying to stick to his guns by defining it so small and specific that it's, it's going to lose. <laughs> if you really believe what he says, it's, it's, it's pretty much worthless for sports. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and it, yeah. It, it, it's interesting. And that's a, that's a very interesting point. And I, I yeah. think I saw you tweet that earlier this afternoon yeah. about, you know, it's 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 it, it, it's it's challenging its position in sports, mm -hmm. and which which is interesting because one of the comments I I wrote down in the p in in the in the paper as I was reading it uh, in preparation for this evening was the the idea the, the almost the realization that Anders is not a coach, mm -hmm. and and that sense of you're 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 an incredible academic and an incredibly important researcher for the development of the domain of expertise and so on and so forth but sometimes you sometimes it, it's difficult for people to to i'm i suppose see the connection for what he's saying when maybe the realization is 
it's a philosophical approach that he's putting forward. It's a, it's a it's an ideal because mm. some of the things because I I do I am a I am a coach I I, mm. I I the other way I'm a coach who has gone into academia mm. over the last four years but I'm I'm primarily a coach and 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 yet I'm a coach who is very very strongly aligned to deliberate practice and I'm a coach in a sporting environment so. Mm. I've always felt that there has been a place for deliberate practice in sport. And yet when you read this paper, you're like, whoa, Anders, don't, you know, almost don't, don't, don't try and answer every single point that has ever been put to you because you know what? Some of those points weren't valid in the first place because they didn't follow the appropriate methodology when they were trying to challenge your work and they didn't follow the, and I know he, he makes some of those points mm -hmm. quite but it did. It did feel like, and as I, and as I said, I, I, a couple of times I wrote down as if I was talking to Anders. But you're not a coach, so you don't know whether that will work or not, man. You know? Yeah. No. <laughs> that, that, if, that's if you said in front of me, I would say, "Sir." I wouldn't say, "Man." I'd say, "Sir." <laughs> three times. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a fantastic point, Ed, and I can sympathize because I'm uh, same as Anders. I'm an academic. That's not really a coach. I dabble. <laughs> in it, but. Yeah. But I think like a specific example of what you're talking about is his point about team sports. Like mm. he he kind of making one of his critiques of, of applying deliberate practice to team sports is you can't possibly do deliberate practice as a whole team because you cannot focus on proving all the individuals on a team at a time at the same time, which I think a good coach would <laughs> have a big argument with. I think that's make kind of a, a naive view of. Uh, Oof, right. um, maybe uh, yeah yeah you think that's too and strong again, uh, yeah i i i i i've spoken on to this point uh, in conferences in the past because yeah. it was a point that i felt especially at the time when some of these these conversations were being had i was heavily involved in team sport at that time mm -hmm. and less so nowadays more just in individual sports but back then heavily involved with team sports and I, I agreed with it. I, mm -hmm. I, I could see now in an overarching sense, yes, as a team, you're doing work that as the team, you want them all to get a principle or a concept based on what the opposition are going to do or what we're going to try and do in defense and so on and so forth. However, you are going to have people who already get the concept. So then it's not, it's mm -hmm. not satisfying deliberate practice for those players who are like, yeah, I, 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 I have this, but we have to go through it because, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledee and the forwards aren't. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have now that's and maybe that's a reflection that maybe I wasn't a good enough coach to be able to make it sufficiently deliberate practice for everybody. But mm -hmm. if we're talking about a general principle of play, you are going to have people at different at different parts of the continuum of, of understanding of what that play is and how to execute that play. Mm -hmm. And I suppose to to go to the extreme, I think if you go to if you went to Barcelona now and had an opportunity to, to to work on a play with the players, there's no way all the players are going to get that sense of what you're trying to do as uh, at the same rate as everyone else, you know. And and it mightn't be that Messi will get it before everybody else because it mightn't be in an area of the field that Messi is as comfortable. Let's say, you know. Yeah. No, I think that's a fair point, and I think this kind of you know. Cla the disagreement we it speaks to the perspective about skill like like if you kind of like more like i'm kind of like if you only believe skill can learn in context then to well, me you can only you can improve a team sport individually <laughs> very well yeah. um i know but that's an extreme view you know but yeah um but but no so that's a, that's a fair point i i think but yeah i think i think that's a good point you make though about uh the view of it the the academic theoretical view of deliberate practice and the application mm -hmm. of it on the coaching. Well, it, yeah. it speaks to another gentleman that you've had on your your show on a number of occasions, and even recently, Professor Keith Davids, mm -hmm. now like, who's having an incredible impact on our domain, incredible mm -hmm. impact, and yet he is the first guy to say, if like anybody, if anyone ever sits down and has the pleasure of sitting down with Keith, the first thing he says, I'm not a coach, mm -hmm. I. I mean, I like my job is to throw things at you guys for you guys then to come back and tell me, Keith, that's actually not happens in the real world. Great. I'll I'll have a look again. And and because mm -hmm. he's such a student of the domain, he he will go and look and he will 
try and, uh, and, and, and piece together the, what the, what the, I suppose, the philosophical and the evidential work is suggesting, but he's still very clear and he's, he's very clear about it with people. I'm not a coach. I, I don't mm-hmm. know where this goes and I don't know how it lands when it leaves what we think it should be, let's say. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think, you know, something that Keith and Anders share in common is they're challenging coaches to yes. think about the purpose and the quality of what's this practice session for, <laughs> you know, which is whether you believe in deliberate practice, that's a very, you know, useful yes. prod, <laughs> you know, from yeah. this. So, um, but, but actually on, on that point, I, I, I spoke, I met with Keith at that at the conference in, in Finland in, in November and the conference that he's, he is the pre- president of that conference. And it's, it, it's an exceptional few days that they, that they run in Kisikalia. But one of the time when we were chatting, I spoke to him about some of the work I'm currently doing with with uh, with golfers. Okay, individual sport seen as a very technical sport, and so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, if it's a sport, it's technical. Whatever the sport, <laughs> if it's a, if there's a skill in there, it's, it's technical. It doesn't just because it's golf doesn't mean it's any more or less technical. Let's say in my opinion. And and we were talking, and, and the, one of the first things he said, he said, I we need to. I'd like to sit down someday and and talk to you in more detail about what it is you're doing with with those players to see if there's merit in others maybe and again speaking about maybe a possible publication or something even an excerpt or something about the process that you're going through as a live coach and how it maybe informs what we talk about from the theoretical perspective and it's mm. and that's where he has that lovely that that lovely interest of well, where is this going? Like he, mm-hmm. he, he's, he's constant. Like, like I said, that came out of the blue, and I was like, oh, I, I'd love to. He said because he said I, I, I'd love to know where that goes because I know, I know how you think, and I really like what you're, how we, you know, how you're seeing things. But I'd like to see where that, li- where how does it land with an athlete? Where you're with dealing with a professional golfer, what does that look like? You know, mm-hmm. yeah, no, that's no, an important no. the bridging, a bridging. I think of it all for me. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Uh, I was ta- I've been talking to a few people about this, and I I tried to do a blog post on this a couple of days ago. I think like comparing and contrasting specific approaches to the same skill, um, same yeah. I think would be really useful kind of exercise and seeing the process and where it goes. And um, so so the uh, one issue, the absolute issue. The, so if it's not so, how this is what did you take as kind of his, not redefinition, but his clarified definition of deliberate practice did you did you pull from- yeah well I, I i was absolutely fascinated by the table in in this where he went through deliberate practice purposeful practice and naive practice mm-hmm. i'm stunned that he actually did that to be honest <laughs> <laughs> i thought i was like when i saw that in the paper i was like anders what are you doing you know um, because because as as you as anyone who's looked at the paper they'll see he ticks the box for purposeful practice for everywhere where there's deliberate practice there's a, so you're 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 asking that question you're asking the question you're saying when you're like well hang on are you are you suggesting and i'm just going to bring it up here in front of me are you suggesting that where that purposeful practice has the same <laughs> characteristics and of course i would say Previously, he would have said no. I know even from some, like some of his recent publications, and he's got another publication due out soon, and his book last year or the year before last with, with um, that gentleman Pool in uh, Peak, and so on and so forth. There were very distinct differences between what he was describing as deliberate practice and purposeful practice. There seems to be less difference now. Let's just put it that way. And now there are still differences. There are still discernible differences, no doubt. But it does appear that they've come a little bit closer, and and again a little. And I, in support of what you were saying uh, earlier, there's a <laughs> there's a sense that he felt the need. I need to answer everything that has been put in front of me before in this paper, and I'm not too sure if that has if that's the if that's the right thing to ever do. To be honest, because again, you're it's almost like you're nailing your your colors to a mast. Which, as a, as a coach, that's that's a very that's a very tough corner to put yourself in when so much 
And so much can be, you know, again, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, it, it, no, I think you're right. Um, um, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I, I appreciate the effort in trying to clarify it because yeah. um, it, oh. a lot of the, you know, arguments before, oh, this, this skill is not consistent with deliberate practice theory. The argument, well, well, you're not measuring deliberate practice <laughs> is always yeah. the argument you, you, you could come back with. So I appreciate his effort to keep clear, trying to clarify, but you're right. <laughs> um, so what I pulled out, um, so I put, he, he brings in some things that, um, that I don't, some details that I didn't really mention, I didn't really associate with the theory itself before. So, so the, so this is what I, um, put one thing, one sentence I call it practice should involve tasks with explicit goals, immediate feedback, knowledge, knowledge of results feedback, and subjects should repeatedly perform the same or similar tasks. Um, so he's getting more specific about the other thing. I think the main way he still differentiates purposeful practice and deliberate practice is, I don't know if you got this, deliberate practice to me is, has to be coach led, right? The coach has to design the training session. So you going out in your backyard and, and saying, I'm going to work on my short game mm -hmm. is purposeful, but it's not deliberate. Right. What you're doing is not a coach that knows that this, that's done this reverse engineering hasn't designed is that do you is yeah. that what you're coming to? Yeah, I, I do think he kind of left the door ajar a bit though as well, because I agree that there is that there the coach led is is a is a significant um is a significant part of deliberate practice that has been retained in this paper. Mm -hmm. But I do think that he, he does he does mention you know the idea of of that communication between the coach, let's say, you know. So so mm -hmm. it, it an athlete could go off for a number of sessions working on something that the coach has maybe identified. The coach isn't there all the time, which which I, I, I was quite pleased to see that he wasn't saying that it had to be the coach with the person every single time, all the time, and it was so rigid, let's say, you know. Um, but but uh, but again, yeah, he he skirts and, and it was the same, it was the same in the 1993 paper. He skirts that issue of what some people would classify as block practice and repetition mm -hmm. with repetition. He does skirt that issue. Does he does he kind of go a little like I I I, I was trying to figure out as I was flipping back and forth between the both both papers, is he going more or less after it? Because it mm -hmm. wasn't quite as clear as it would have been in the 1993 paper. Um, which Again, because of the scales work that is done in music, it's probably easier to, uh, you know, uh, associate that type of practice with that type of with that type of a, a domain. Let's say, you know, um, mm -hmm. which is it's a point that came up uh, with a chat with Stuart Armstrong on Monday when when somebody we were in a chat and someone asked about uh, music. Let's say, and one of the things we were saying is that. It's 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 a little unfair to compare music domains to to the sport domain because of the the dynamic environment of the sport domain is very different to the very static dynamic of a piano or a drum kit or a guitar. The 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 musical instruments or the the attentional focus of those musical instruments isn't changing. The strings aren't going anywhere. The the the, the keys on the piano aren't going anywhere, and they're set. Let's say. So I think sometimes we need to be careful in how we how we how we jump d uh, across domains and that you know and, and again as, as Stu said on that day he's uncomfortable when people use mathematical analogies about how we learn math to how we learn sports skills because that's that that that's trying to reduce the argument down to a well it's either that or that and and it's never that simple yeah no those are great points I, I have the same issue so my problem well with math especially the reason you can't compare it to sports is there's right answers in math. We know there's universally accepted right answer. The, yeah. you know, uh, the example I gave, you know, uh, F um, Fosbury, you know, in the, the high jump, he came up with two plus two equals five, right? He came up with his own. So, and music Excellent. too. Music, obviously there's room for expression and individuality, but there's right things. Technique is way more targeted that you have to hit than in any sport most sports but and i'm glad you raised that point about 
um, training, not having the coach always there. That's a good, that's mm. it. The coach designed the practice, but he makes a big point that solo training by yourself yeah. is a big, is a big part of deliberate practice in his view. And I think he's, yeah. there's a study where they actually looked at the amount athletes yes. trained by themselves and it was actually a strong predictor of, of yes, skill, yeah. I think. And, and, and again, it. even some of the papers that, that let's say looked at it, and as he mentions in this paper, the 2020 paper, it, that he there was an explosion of in of interest in this area of deliberate practice shortly thereafter. You look at the, the like his paper was paid, published in ninety three, and before they even hit two thousand, you already had, as I said earlier, Janet Starks looking at it, Nikki Hodges, you had Werner Helsen, and all of their associated colleagues looking at this area within the sports domain. And of course, straight away they were able to identify certain things that 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 aligned. But then, of course, with the wrestling paper, the paper around wrestling, where you, you it's really hard to wrestle on your own. So there is, yeah. the, and yet, so the, they were able to distinguish that difference straight away between that and also then add in that the effort, the efforts that Anders had spoken about originally, well, there, that there's two strands to effort. Now that we're actually wrestling is extremely physically effortful. And mm -hmm. there's also, so cognitive effort uh, applied to that. And I think that's where, again, back to your point earlier, that's where the, the there was a there was an opportunity for the the almost natural progression of the theory of deliberate practice to to go in a very stepwise way over the years mm -hmm. that oh oh little refinement and oh here's a little refinement and uh, of course we're going to adapt to it because we're not going to we're not going to pin your pin you down just on what you said in 1993 it's going to evolve because other researchers are feeding into this domain but it didn't it became it became a defense very quickly because some of the some of the researchers out there went after it to debunk it as opposed to going after it to enhance it or or just even interrogate it a little bit more and mm -hmm. i think that's where as you say that when we come back to you know that explicit instruction the the immediate knowledge of results that 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 same and repeated tasks that then became almost the that became almost a stick that he was either beaten with or that he had to defend with mm -hmm. as he went his, his the, the you know the journey that he's on with this this one topic yeah, no, and I, I think that you're right. It, it is, uh, we would have benefited from more of a slow development. And well, I really, one of the things I always talk about deliberate practice in class with students, I, I, I really like deliberate practice because it's a strong theory. Like it's mm. really making a bold claim. The most important thing about a component of expertise is the accumulation of this deliberate practice. It's not what you're yeah. born with. Uh, look how much it stirred up the field. <laughs> like yeah. it really had like a wishy-washy theory that was like, oh, it's partly practice, right? Like would never have done this, right? <laughs> so I, I like people that, you know, step out and yeah. even if you, yeah. you know, it's he's had to defend and it's caused this. You know, I, I look how much, yeah. you know, it's really motivated people. You're right to attack it and, and try to make a generalized books out of it for popular you know it's not but sure I, I, like I, I like yourself i teach i uh as yeah. i teach practice gets its own like two weeks worth almost like you know <laughs> we're, we're going after this and i have slides that i show i said well here's the original paper here's excerpts from the paper now and here's what happened as a result and i have like two or three slides of all the books and all mm -hmm. the shows and everything that have actually been spawned as a result of it and and like you look at, let's say, Gladwell was the one that maybe, you know, there's the Calvin book and there's the Saeed book and there's the, you know, Epstein had his book, The Sports Gene. But again, if you look at if you look at even the Sports Gene book, the, the mention of the nurture and environment throughout that book is incredible when you consider that the book is Sports Gene and yet yeah. get away from the environment. It's it's mentioned so often, you know. But but when you think back of the the impact it had. Yes, uh, Anders may may in public say no. Well, you you did this, and you you know you misinterpret that. But privately, he must have been absolutely delighted because, you know, what what does any research hope is that, that it actually reaches the masses? And you 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 could go on holidays around Europe, and I remember being on holidays back, you know, when when this all kicked off with outliers and the like, and it was on the beaches, it was around the pools, mm -hmm. reading these books on holidays. And you're like, this is in, this is incredible. There, 
this like this is an area of interest that I, this is my PhD in <laughs> reading some work that's related. You know, you'd never get that before. And the, the beauty of it is that you've got someone like a Malcolm Gladwell, who's a brilliant writer mm -hmm. and gets it out there because of his ability to tell a really good story. Now, the fallout, of course, was just incredible because of that 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 classic title, the chapter title uh, that he, he gave it. But the, the knock on effect is, is that it actually be, it, it, it's is that it became something of a conversation at every level and not just it, it broke it out of academia which which i think again is unfortunate that it didn't that should have that should have encouraged greater interrogation of the work as as opposed to attacking of the work and i think yeah. there's a difference there let's say you know yeah trying to build on it yeah yeah you, your point about outliers is, is i used to when people ask me what research I do. I used to say, if I didn't want to get into it, I say, Did you, have you read Outliers? That kind of stuff. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. almost everybody yeah. you talked to had it. It was a super popular yeah. book. And oh, yeah, yeah. I, I give, if I, I give you a personal experience, a, a number of years, back in 2016, the every year the the Olympics have, um, every year there's, there's the Olympics, uh, there's, there's like some conferences that are built around it, let's say. And one year, the Edinburgh Science Festival had a, an Olympic theme to their science festival. And I was asked to, to, to engage in a debate on Olympians born or built. Now, the only reason that's come about was because of, of all of this work. And it was me on, on the, obviously, the, the built side of the argument and Yanis Pitsiladis, who appears quite a lot in in the sports gene on the born side of the argument and and again it was like he's a he's a gentleman he it was a great evening again of course because of his work and so on but one of the jokes of the evening was when he had his opportunity to present his case i was sitting waiting for my turn and in his i think 15 minute uh you know punt he mentioned the he actually used the word environment 20 seven times even though and I, and I remember I remember thinking I was like you well th thank you uh, professor because you just you know I won't be saying genetics 27 times in my presentation be, but is it because of that there it, it brought the nature versus nurture debate to the masses which we we all can be thankful for because I think there was a period of time there in the 90s it was getting a bit scary with where people were thinking this was, you know, the oh he's such you can't teach that these kind of commentaries from from commentators in sports and oh he's he or she what well, uh, she's just a natural and oh that's such such a talent oh such a gifted player and no, it was getting that way and I think this helped maybe stem the flow a little bit for a while anyway certainly for it, uh, at least. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think from, I you know, I interviewed Anders and talking to them. I think he was just, I think he was just really excited by his, I think he's got a little BF Skinner in him, even though he's a little, you know, kind of hedging his bets here. The idea that you you give me enough time and do the proper thing, I can make an expert. I think, I don't know he doesn't believe that universally, but the I think his working memory, I don't think yeah. he ever expected he could do that. With someone and, and then talking yes. to the chest, you know, he has a story of the gut. Wasn't there is a father that raised all decided all his kids were going to be chess masters and he pretty much did. Yeah. 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 So I think it, it is. It's a really interesting. So it's wrapped up in all this. Um, yeah. Um, is there anything else? Yeah. So the purposeful. Um, so, yeah, I think we talked about maybe we talked about this before on the air. Um, there's a step back from, you know, I think. Uh, I don't think it's his claim that he ever made, but the kind of the, the interpretation of the monotonic relationship that mm. he said, um, uh, what do you say? Deliver practice. Um, the amount of delivery practice is related to the level of performance, not the determinant of the level of performance. Yeah. I don't know if he'd ever have made that claim any, anyway, but he does clarify that. Yeah. I think I, I, that's an interesting point. That stuck stuck out with me as well. It, that seemed to have been a softening of his stance. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and and may, and maybe, and maybe that's as a result of let's say the 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 work that's been done by 
by other very, very capable researchers as well, the likes of um, of Brooke McNamara and her and her group that have maybe looked at looked at it in in the kind of detail of well, what are you suggesting and what what level of variance is there and what 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 kind of numbers are you suggesting and if you are suggesting, well, how, why are you suggesting that and what what methods did you use to come up with that compared to the methods that we're trying to use to look and to further interrogate it? Let's say you know. Um, now, in fairness, he does. He gives a pretty sound rebuttal to some of that work, but it does definitely, it does definitely ask the question about about again the monotonic benefits that that, that accumulation. Now, there's no one going to say that it doesn't exist. It's just because it does. Of course, you, it's not something that can be fast uh, fast tracked in seconds or minutes. Mm -hmm. It is our many hours of them, let's say, you know, or many of those hours. It's just, again, it comes back down to where he possibly digs his heels in a little bit, is that idea of, yeah, and I think you said it already, yeah, I see what you're trying to say, but what you were measuring there isn't deliberate practice. <laughs> All right. So it doesn't really apply. <laughs> so it, that's where it can get a little bit, and I don't want, I don't want to say petty because we're talking about, something again world-class researchers here mm -hmm. are defending their work in a way that or, or or trying to or trying to challenge another person's work let's say in a way that um it gets down to the the minutiae and i think when you're trying to get down to the minutiae of something like this i think you can get lost then i think you almost lose the essence of what they're trying to say and i'm not too sure if, if deliberate practice was ever meant to be something that was going to have this much fine detail interrogation on it down to the, you know, down to the, as I said, the minutia of every single aspect of what was spoken about in 1993. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And yeah, the, the problem I had with it, you know, Patty, I, to me, it was almost appro approaching being unfalsifiable, right? If you can all, if you can constantly refer, you know, pick at that's not deliberate practice. What do I have to do to show that? Yeah. This isn't, yeah. You can always yeah. refer to that. Um, that that's a bit of a, a challenge. So yeah, I think that's you're right. It, there's definitely a second. And the other one, um, of, of course, is deliberate practice is not the only is not the only type of practice that improves performance. That With, seems to be a bit of a softening. Yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, but again, I think it's a softening towards what sports are experiencing, mm -hmm. you know, almost. And again, when we look, look, look at the outlet that this is in. It's in the Journal of Sports Sciences, you know, mm -hmm. not in a psychological bulletin where the original paper was in, which, you know, which would have a, a, a good following, but not in the sports, not, not by sports uh, practitioners, whereas the Journal of Sports Sciences that 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 says as much to me about where he was aiming for this to land. Let's say you know, um, again that purposeful practice. When you go back to that table one, all of the things that he mentions around deliberate practice gets a lovely ticked box in the purposeful practice yeah. column that do not get ticked in the naive practice column. I think I pull this up here if you want to. Have a, yeah, that, let me see if I can. Um, I'll pull this up on the screen in case. They, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how big it's, it's going to come out big enough, but there it is. Yeah. Yes. Purposeful practice. <laughs> Deliberate practice. One, two, three. <laughs> purposeful. Check, check, yeah. check. Um, it is. And it's incredible. And it, even 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 more so, uh, uh, like when you see even the subsections within it, you know, like he, he even says practice, individualized design of effective practice and a teacher conducts an individualized diagnosis to determine the next appropriate goal for individualized practice. But he gives that as a tick to purposeful practice, which yeah. is where I was speaking earlier on saying, well, there is still a conversation with the coach in purposeful practice. There is. What, what, what it may be is saying is, what it may be is saying is that this for me was, and I may be misinterpreting it, and I, I haven't spoken to the man himself about it, mm. but it's almost a tip of the hat to say, the repetitive nature that is existed, that is, you know, is is apparent and and has been decades long and maybe even centuries long in the in the in the learning of music music skills 
is not possible in the dynamic environment of a sport. And I think that's that's almost for me a suggestion. And it's hard to know without the man being being here himself, but it is because he still gives purposeful practice that tick, even though in the deliberate practice column he mentions that coach-led element. So so the coach obviously can't be sitting right next to you uh, uh, as they do when you're playing the violin or playing the piano or the cello or whatever, because you're you're running, you're 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 you, you, do you know what I mean? You're doing something, you're engaging with another person, unless of course it's archery or shooting and so on and so forth. But there are, I think that's that's as we said, that's a softening, and it's it's almost a bringing, it's almost a bridging uh, statement here in that table to suggest that. If deliberate practice isn't um, exactly ca- possible for sport, well, then your next best thing to do is purposeful practice. Yeah. But be sure you put in the naive practice space. Yeah. I, I, yeah. To me, it's also yeah, change to yeah, pulling them moving in both directions. Because maybe I take the yeah. term purposeful too generally, but to me, I never. The big difference between deliberate and purposeful, one of the big is the expertise approach for me, right? So if I if I decide I want to improve my arm in baseball and be able to throw farther, to me, if I go back, if I go out my yard and just put targets really far away and keep trying yeah. to throw to them, that's purposeful. It's not very smart. Yeah. And I'm not following the expertise approach, right? I'm not I'm not basing how I'm training based on how experts do it. But I have a clear purpose of what I'm doing. Maybe that's that's too general. That's what I always thought he meant by purposeful practice, just having a clear goal and an intention mm-hmm. to improve. Whereas this, he seems to adding a lot more to purposeful practice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and again, and I think like like that, I I agree from what I would have thought purposeful was, but just the English word purpose. What does it mean? You, you look it up in the dictionary, kind of thing. But I think that's that is a. Like, like I said, that it's almost like a bridging. It's almost like it, it, he's creating a form of practice that he's 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 recognizing is impactful for the development of your expertise and in, is impactful for the improvement of your of your you know your performance and and, and all about like all the things he speaks about relevant to overall performance improvement and so on and so forth has ticks all those other boxes around even the the, the original tenets of effortful, not a measly rewarding, not inherently enjoyable. Um, but it also, but as I said, it, it, it softens, it softens the, the rigor that is, that he has spoken about uh, in the music domain. It definitely does. It, it is definitely a shift from that, but, but still subtle enough to be far enough away from the naive practice, you know? He's making a, I think he's making a very specific point around the naive practice. But it is also, I think, he, like I read, I, I read that table a number of times, and there was there was times when I would go further down into the paper that I would go back up to the table because he he cites the paper a number of times. Go to table one. That's that's said in table one, and go back to table one. And there was a few times I was like, yes, he's doing this little bridging thing, but he's also it's a real slap to people who are who have tried to challenge what it is and to basically say no no actually do you know what i've put what you have been researching in a little box so if you want to go back and and make an apology for saying that uh, about the variance of deliberate practice and about you know is it sufficient and so on and so forth yeah y- y- you just need to change the title of all your papers to purposeful practice because it's not deliberate practice <laughs> And I might be doing him a disservice, but but there he mentions table one so often in the paper that it it, it is a real it, for me it was quite a deliberate signposting for future researchers. If yeah. you have any, if any doubt, if there's any doubt in your mind about what deliberate practice is, this is it. Now, if you want to, if you if you're not happy with that, here's here's deliberate practice light. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. And he even goes so far, I know you mentioned some of the McNamara studies. He goes so far as, I think he published a paper where he, they did a systematic review and he redid it, taking a bunch of the studies out that he didn't think fit with the liver, which is, which is quite bold. <laughs> but, but so yeah, he's yeah. doing exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so I guess what I was talking about before with throwing it in my backyard is a naive practice now because I don't have a you know, so yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting, you're right, clarification. So, 
which I think is a nice point again, back to the work that Mar Mark Williams has done, and he's done a few papers around this, which is, is in the application of the expert performance approach. And, and the expert performance approach comes up in a load of people's research. A lot of the guys in Australia, you look at the stuff that Damien Farr and all his colleagues over the years have done, there's a lot of the, 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 the expert performance approach underpinning the methodology of those papers you know a lot of the stuff that's been that that that's been done in, in Europe around some of the the research groups in in the UK and the like again it's still been underpinned in that uh, that that the expert performance approach let's say and i think that's a significant uh, for me that's a significant thing that has reminded me of that by reading this let's say you know and i think that's also something that came up for me when i was reading this because the like we spoke about the 1993 paper being a behemoth and it is it's uh, like i remember like it was essential to my phd but before it became essential to my phd i thought i read it but i hadn't really read it <laughs> i'd be the first to admit i i i thought i had read it so when all of a sudden i was like oh so my actually my entire work for the next number of years is going to be in this paper and then i actually read it i was like whoa I, this is like a brand new paper because there is so much in it. And it was, it, it was stark over the years that followed the amount of people who admitted I couldn't finish it. I just couldn't get to the end of that paper. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is, there is almost, there is, there, there, this is something that is a lot more digestible. I would love, I would have loved if this paper was around back when I was starting my work. Um, in this domain because it is much more accessible let's put it that way yeah no no that's a good and i really like your point there too about the expertise expertise approach uh i think in a way it has more it's more enduring <laughs> and then despite all the things of deliberate practice it's it, it's everywhere you're right we, everybody uses mm -hmm. we look at what experts do differently than lower levels and then we reverse <laughs> we try to reverse engineer that or understand that at least as researchers mm -hmm. yeah so i think that's well it, it's an interesting point you made an interesting point there about how it's maybe endured and possibly it is, is endured based on what we said earlier is that there's options within the expert performance approach. Whereas the 1993 paper, the seminal research in deliberate practice didn't give many options. So when yeah. you, if you start such a narrow space, it then, it, it, it gives it no, it, it, it's very hard for it to grow beyond that. If you're then going to hold it into this very, uh, very narrow corridor. So let's say even even the work that you mentioned earlier, our 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 paper from last year. One of the things that we we found when we actually did a deliberate practice intervention was, we found that there's a significant impact on task consolidation, in in that work. So if you just reflect on your work, it has a, it it significantly impacts the effect that deliberate practice can have on you whereas if you if yes if i'm doing something that the coach is led and, da, 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 and, and do, I, I i tick all those boxes but i don't reflect on the work and i don't reflect on my practice and i just drop my my, my, my kit back when i get home and drive on you are of course dulling the potential response whereas if you can layer it with reflective practice well of course then you are consolidating the work that you've just done which also feeds to the the next work that lovely reflective practice cycle that that again, most coaches will engage in, let's say, you know, what what are we going to do the next session? Well, what happened in this session determines what we do the next session. What happened in the last match or last event determines what we do the next session. It, it's that cycle, let's say. And I think that's probably why the expert performance approach has endured because there's mobility in it. There's there's not much mobility in the, in, in the 1993 paper. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And yeah, I think if you don't try to nail, you keep, treat it as a true approach, and he tries to a bit to nail a theory to it of what the mechanisms are, because you can equally say use the expertise the the, the expert based to talk about well experts have a, a this specific technique I have to teach you or you can say experts have these motor synergies of functional variability mm -hmm. it fits with either theory you're you're basically what's different about experts let's try to make novices have that right yeah. so it it works with either one if you keep it the vague so. Um, just, just, sorry, sorry just, just one last point there around that idea of what he was saying, let's say. I, mm -hmm. Over the years, Anders, as you know, he's had many people come after him in his work. And mm -hmm. his bottles and his commentaries 
for anyone who hasn't looked at them, they are a they are a textbook way of actually responding to people who are challenging your work. He has been incredibly professional over the years in how he has managed his rebuttals and commentaries back to people from the paper that Tucker and Collins did and the, the, the McNamara and Hambrick work papers and all and, and many, many others. And I got a sense from this paper <laughs> that there was a sense from, OK, enough is enough. No more Mr. Nice Guy. OK, mm -hmm. I've been I've, I've tried to be cordial in the past, but there's a few of you just not listening. This is and then I, I, I that's it. Yeah, I put my foot down now, and, mm. and I'm going to make a, a couple of amendments, but I'm still putting my foot down on a few things, and and it's just interesting. And, and who who am I to say that he doesn't have that right to do that? You know? Yeah. No, I agree with you there, and and I I think it's like this is admirable, like the amount of effort to oh. review all these studies that have done uh, built on his work, and and this was taken forever to write. Like people might be frustrated. Why did you let us keep believing these things? Well, instead of jumping in, but it, it takes time to do all this analysis and write it and get it published. You're right. If we had a yeah. different forum where we could debate this live, <laughs> it, it might have been a different story. But um, we're, okay. we're coming up around the hour, Ed. So maybe yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about some of the stuff you guys have going on with MSAI in a second. But maybe uh, like to conclude, where does this? Where do you think this leaves us? with deliberate practice in, in, in sports specifically, probably, or, or in general, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think I think as as an academic, it, it's it's great because it kind of invigorates me for for, uh, the, uh, you know, further research in this area, because I, I think he's opened the door for 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 more refinement, which is great. Um, as an academic, I, I'm very pleased with that in that regard, because there, there, there's definitely a softening certain in places. So, so again, like anybody else, I, I'm very interested then to go in and, and, and maybe interrogate that a little bit more and see if, if, if our work can contribute in some small way to that. As a coach, it hasn't changed that much for me because I, as I said, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of what he said back in 1993. Like, and again, the, 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 the detail in that, in that paper, in the behemoth, we call it, um, is, is, is remarkably strong for the development of expertise. Now, I'm, I'm not too sure how much of that I do unconsciously marrying the expert performance approach as well. So I don't know, because again, they, they're, they're both two very important parts of the way I work. But I, I think as a coach, I think this is an important paper. I, I, I do. I think it's an important paper because it it, it will it'll help people either uh, all, come closer to um, an understanding of what you know ideal practice or best practice should look like or could look like and can look like, but it also helps people may, maybe get into the area a little bit more and and ask themselves better questions of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I think. I think it's great. I, I, as I said, I loved reading it. I absolutely mm -hmm. loved reading it. Um, and I do, I think it's an important, like you said, it's an incredible piece of work to have put together. Um, I have no idea the amount of effort that must have gone into doing it. Um, but yeah, I think, I, think it's a, I think it's a positive contribution. It's definitely moved the dial forward. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, I definitely I agree totally. And, and my kind of, I think, you know, it's, if you really stick to his really strict, strict definition of deliberate practice, he's trying to put forward, I kind of stick, I don't know what I agree with him in a way, it, I don't know how much relevance it has to sport, the, the specifics, of it, but I think the, the elements of it and the spirit of it, and that things like purpose with extension to purposeful practice are incredibly important, and continue mm. to be sport. I always say, you know, when I work consulting stuff, Half the time I do with coaches is just ask why, right? Practice sector, why are you doing that? So this continued yeah. focus on what the goal of the practice is, what mm -hmm. elements are needed for improvement, it's, it's really valuable, I think, and yeah. continue to talk about this. So I really like that. Um, before we finish, I just I wanted to ask, uh, I'll let you have a moment to talk about, so the, the Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland group, you've been doing a really interesting um, set of webinars um, for people 
they can sign up for you. You've done a few already, and I know you still have um, some coming. So I wanted to give you a little. Uh, if you're interested in what I've been doing, you'll definitely be interested in those. So I wanted to give Ed a little chance to talk about those. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah. yeah, Movement of Skill Acquisition Ireland. We, 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 the we is myself, Ollie Logan, Phil Carney, and Alan Dunton. We're we're inspired by people like you, Rob. To be perfectly honest. Um, the, we started up in 2018. We did a conference in 2018. We did a conference due in April in 2020. And something, we're not too sure what it was, came and disrupted that. And uh, <laughs> so we went back to our speakers and asked them would they be happy to contribute to a webinar around what they were going to talk about. And uh, in in lieu in, of, of the conference actually going ahead. And incredibly, they were all more than happy to do it which is which is a, a real a real honor for us and and that's what we've been doing every friday we've won now tomorrow with marco sullivan and dennis Hortin from aik in stockholm talking about their work in changing the perspectives of what youth development it, it looks like in football from a biopsychosocial perspective and 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 a general kind of you know form of life perspective and um, and we have a follow up one next week with with George van der Breggen and Jan Verbeek from the Dutch FA. These are the the heads of development, youth development in the Dutch FA next week. Um, and I think, as I said, we're, the, the, our work is is really trying to, in one sense, like it, it, you could think, in one sense, it's very selfish because we love just <laughs> we get a kick out of it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but but in the other sense, it's to try and it's to try and bring skill acquisition into the conversation more. And that's what we're really trying to do. Um, it's something like, as you saw, there's some, I, I, like the, I, I'm putting together a directory of people who are in skill acquisition at the moment for that very purpose, so that people r realize that there's a lot of people in skill acquisition already, and there's a lot of really good people that need to, I suppose, be, be contacted. You know, I think sometimes. Um, sometimes there's a few people get contacted a lot and, and you realize, well, actually, there's a lot more than just this handful or a couple of handfuls of people in this domain. There are people all over the world. And I think that's something that we're, we're trying to do. But also then from an Ir for, within Ireland, that's kind of just something there's here's four guys who have a huge interest be it in our work practi practically for all four of us and academically in skill acquisition, they were thinking, let's see if we can contribute. However, and I think this is something we said beforehand, we want to try and contribute in a way that adds, and this is something that we're even discussing at the moment. There's a lot of content out there at the moment, and there's some exceptional content, and I'm not too sure if we want to add more to the noise that may take away from that exceptional content. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because you you want to make sure that it's quality over over quantity because there's there's a lot of content right now going around so we're we're in we we had a discussion even today about it what what do we do now you know we're coming to the end of the speakers that we had for 2020 and where do we go from here let's say and how do we still try and make some small contribution to the to the conversation um now and again, you you come up in our discussions because people like you make a huge contribution. To this. <laughs> but we, if we felt that we could even something like what, what we do brings people to you, well, then I think that's something that we would continue to do. You know? Like <laughs> my, all my students know who Rob Gray is; they probably know who you are. <laughs> they know who I am. They know who I am. But so it's it's trying to get that balance right. So what we're trying to do in Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland is to try and try and add to the conversation, but not add to the noise. Yeah, no, I think that's really noble of you. And, you know, it's so easy, you know, to just throw yourself out there for, for the sake of doing it. And yeah, you also mentioned the the previous ones that you've, re, you've done are also, they're available on your YouTube channel, right? There's some really yeah, good we ones. Yeah, we have a YouTube channel up there. And, I, yeah. and again, it's, Funny, it's a funny word that I'm not that that, that familiar with. Maybe it's my age, mm -hmm. but you get sucked into the metrics so quickly. You know how many mm -hmm. views and, how many and you're like, it, it can't become that for me anyway. Personally, I, I won't speak for the other three, but it can't because then all of a sudden you're you're chasing, you know, and I I, I, I think there's enough of that going on without us adding to us in that regard. 
Yeah, no, I could tell you from the pod, from the podcast doing it for five years. Now, I, I was at first, I was, you know, you almost daily refreshing how many downloads. <laughs> now you realize quickly it's the, the engagement you get out of it. The connections are way, are worth way more than views or yeah. subscriptions or that's way more valuable. So yeah. um, I agree yeah. totally. So uh, thanks for doing this. Ed. That, was, that was a really uh, fun discussion. Thank I'm going to end the live thing. We can stay for a second. And so thank you everyone for listening. Thank you.